This is about as toxic as it can get. But who hated her enough to do her in? Her down on the luck tenants suddenly forced out by her. Did you ever say I could kill this woman? I said I could wring her neck. Or a put upon assistant taken advantage of once too often. We found a murder weapon. Or could it be all three? To leave so little evidence at the scene would have taken multiple people. Tonight, follow the footprints, fingerprints, a bloody smear on the bed, explosive interrogation tapes. 100% I am letting you know that's a lie. And a grisly find in the trash. I said, am I dreaming? You're not dreaming, there's a dead body. With life and now death in a posh resort, who's guilty? Money is the thread running through all of this. Who has it and who wants it? Enough to kill. People say that just doesn't add up. Tonight, relationships from hell. Here's Deborah Roberts. The chilly charm of a winter evening in Tony Aspen, Colorado, shatters like ice. At a home high up on West Buttermilk Road, upstairs in a bedroom, locked in a walk-in closet, wrapped with care, a body, a battered, bloody, and very much dead body. Oh, oh my God! 911, please. Ma'am, tell me exactly what happened. I got my friend in the closet. <laughs> That shrieking voice on the phone, a woman in all-out panic, is Kathy Carpenter. Fearing for her life, afraid the killer is still nearby. Her frantic, sometimes garbled 911 call comes from behind the wheel of her car as she bolts down the mountain, away from the body in the closet, to safety. Okay, ma'am, I need you to take a deep breath so that I can send you help. I, I can't. My friend is in your closet. Yes! Full of blood wrapped in a string. Seconds later, this dash cam video shows a police officer at the side of the road trying to calm her down. Try and relax, okay? The woman she just discovered is Nancy Pfister, one of her closest friends. Denver author Stephen Singular is writing a book about the case. Kathy Carpenter drives up to Nancy's house. And she looks around and she notices, number one, the bed is made. And she said, this is not right. Nancy Pfister never made a bed in her life. Something doesn't add up here. The master bedroom closet door was locked and that the key was not in the lock to that closet, which she said was unusual. Developing story out of Aspen. Murder of a social life. Pfister was found beaten to death, found dead. The Aspen community is horrified. There is a lot of concern. Aspen is not the murder capital of anywhere. Very rare, yes. This was the first murder in over a decade in Aspen. In this playground made of snow and money, the rich and famous billionaires by the dozen come for the scene and to be seen. Sometimes there's even skiing. And now on this February night in 2014, a dead body in a closet of all places. What happened only slightly more shocking than who it happened to. Nancy Pfister, the woman in the closet, was a prominent jet set heiress. Her family, one of the oldest, most respected names in Colorado, ski mountain pioneers. Give me a sense of what the Pfisters meant to that town. They were often referred to as Aspen royalty. I mean, these were some of the founding families that actually got Aspen on the map as a ski resort. My grandparents were there very long ago before Aspen was Aspen. Nancy's 28-year-old daughter Juliana says freedom was the hallmark of her mother's life, fitting since Nancy was born on Independence Day. She always loved that fact that she was born on the 4th of July. And she was like, you guys, you're throwing all these parties for me. This, this is fireworks there for me, for sure. <laughs> High-flying celebrations would become a theme. With that face, that family, that trust fund, it was clear, even from an early age, that for Nancy Pfister, the sky was the limit. There was something about her that just really drew people to her, like Moss of the Flame, you know? She never had a career, per se, but sometimes it seemed that being Nancy Pfister was a full-time job. She was not the run-of-the-mill, what, I guess, what you might think Aspen has become kind of person. She was real cute, very cute. 
Nancy's Aspen High classmate, David Coffin. Nancy was, was a, a presence, a, a light. I don't think I ever have met a person in my life quite like Nancy. Local spa owner Rita Bellino says Nancy wasn't one for manicures, but she knew her well. Her whole life was about fun and travel, and that was her life mantra, I think. Yes. She saw herself as Aspen's ambassador to the world. And this is where all the Acting as a tour guide for a French TV show. Chauffeuring the Dalai Lama when he came to town. Hanging out with the likes of Goldie Hawn and gonzo journalist Hunter S. Thompson. Hollywood's leading men like Michael Douglas and Jack Nicholson were rumored to be part of Nancy's romantic life. I went up there one day and I knocked on the door. And Jack Nicholson answers the door. <laughs> like, hi, Jack. Is Nancy here? Nancy lived and played like a classic trust fund kid, but with a catch that will soon become significant. In truth, the heiress lived on a budget. The money was controlled pretty tightly. The interesting thing about when she's referred to as a socialite or a philanthropist or someone who's very wealthy, it's much more complicated than that. The money was controlled by a law firm in Aspen, and it was basically doled out as an allowance. That allowance reportedly $7,000 a month. To pay for some of her jet-setting holidays, Nancy decided to rent out her spacious multi-million dollar mountain home. She needed that money. She needed the money. Which is how she met Dr. William F. Styler III, known as Trey, and his wife Nancy. They were moving to town from Denver and happy to rent Nancy's house while she wintered in Australia. It was classic Nancy Pfister, unpredictable, spur of the moment. Yet there were those who worried that one day Nancy's carefree lifestyle would get her into trouble. All those men in her busy love life, could one of them be a killer? Sometimes these weren't people she knew very well. In the days after her death, there was plenty of room for that kind of speculation because police weren't talking. What matters is that my mom is gone and we need to figure out who did it. Investigators left with a wrapped body in a closet and so many questions. Who was this careful killer? We were investigating the case and, and trying to figure out who Nancy Pfister was, trying to figure out who could have harbored a motive and who could have done this to her. It was a stunning moment sure to bring bad press for this quaint old town of fewer than 7,000 people. How ready was the town for this kind of explosion? This is a story of a very wealthy town that doesn't want its dirt made public. When we come back, the hunt for Nancy Pfister's killer, an investigation with all the hairpin turns, and more danger than any of Aspen's famous Black Diamond ski trails. Who locked that closet door and threw away the key? The key is sort of a big deal. Stay with us. We continue with Relationships from Hell. Once again, Deborah Roberts. Fister's body was found badly beaten. Just the murder of one of Aspen, Colorado's most prominent residents, Nancy Fister, goes national. Now we move to the latest on that murder mystery in Aspen, Colorado. The first murder there in 12 years. And leaves this celebrity hotspot on edge. A battered body representing an enigma wrapped up in a mystery. It was almost kind of like Aspen dying. It's a part of Aspen. How could someone do that? Deputy DA Andrea Bryan is among the first on the scene. When you walked into the closet, it took a little while to realize that you were looking at a body. Police painstakingly documenting footprints in the snow, fingerprints, a bloody smear on the bed. But the house is selfish with its secrets. The body left in a closet, the door locked, the key missing. And so is the murder weapon. There was not a lot of forensic evidence on the crime scene itself. An autopsy determines Nancy Pfister died of blunt force trauma, repeated blows to the head. The weapon, possibly something like a hammer. Nancy had been sleepy, wearing eye shades and earplugs. She never saw it coming. The medical examiner also estimates she'd been dead a day or two before her body was discovered. 
But get this, bizarrely, barely a drop of blood visible after the attack. The crime itself was, was very violent, but the um, crime scene did not contain very much blood at all. In fact, the only obvious trace, that smear, see it right there on the headboard. Then police lift the mattress and find a gruesome surprise on the underside. The killer or an accomplice trying to hide their handiwork. The mattress was flipped to hide the blood. These actual crime scene photos revealing the killer then wrapped the body in a shroud of towels, bed sheets, and garbage bags. Then dragged Nancy's body into the closet, perhaps hoping to dispose of it later. Early on, we did believe that whoever had committed this crime, whoever had murdered her, had intended for her body not to be found for quite some time and make it look as if she had traveled somewhere, left the country, left the area. Investigators also conclude they're looking for more than one suspect. A crime committed in such a violent manner would have taken um, some planning and, and multiple people. More than one murderer? How can that be when many have trouble imagining even one person who'd want to kill Aspen's party princess? Then thoughts turn to that nice couple renting Nancy's house. Remember them? Dr. Trey Styler and his wife, also named Nancy? What's their story? What kind of a life had the Stylers led before this? He was a very prominent anesthesiologist in Denver. But he's burning through all of his but money. he's burning through money, and there's this long arc of starting to go downhill. His wife has medical problems. He has medical problems. Down on their luck, strapped for cash, the Stylers hope to change their fortunes in Aspen. Were you coming to Aspen in a way as sort of broken people? who needed a new star? Broken people who needed a new star, but with a lot of energy. For Nancy Pfister, the needy heiress, that house with its desirable slopeside location is an asset. She's happy to rent it to the stylers for $4,000 a month in cash. We go up to the house and she's in a bathrobe with pearls on and a glass of pink champagne. And I said, this is too good to be true and she looked at me and she said it's karma darling after nancy's death attention also swirls around her friend and assistant kathy carpenter what about the relationship between kathy and nancy nancy was known especially when she was drinking for ordering people around and it was part of this uh, aspen princess syndrome let's call it and it crept into the relationship between kathy and nancy was there tension? There was tension and there was resentment. You're, you're taking me to parties and you're introducing me to fancy people, but you want me to wait on you. You know, you want me to be your servant. Happy highs, Nance. In I fact, just listen to the last voicemail Nancy Pfister left Kathy the day before police believe she died. I couldn't get any toothpaste here. So um, I'm just having cold pain. It's horrible and I'd like to have some without fluoride. That would be great. Thank you so much. Kathy Carpenter did develop a bit of a friendship with uh, the Stylers and maybe even bonded a little bit over um, some mutual resentment toward Nancy Pfister. Were you and Kathy getting closer as Nancy was in Australia? Absolutely. She would come over three times a week. I was doing spa treatments on her. Yeah. I got very close with Kathy. But the Stylers' relationship with Nancy Pfister turned sour from day one and continued long distance while she was in Australia, with her complaining that they weren't paying rent or taking care of the place. She would send emails and then just say horrible things about us. In one email, Pfister blasted the Stylers, saying, quote, I have never known anybody worse than you. Very bad karma. Why would that, she send emails saying that? Because we weren't paying her the money that she wanted. She wanted more and more money. Finally, Pfister angrily sends word that she's jetting home from her winter getaway in Sydney and wants the Stylers out. Kathy comes over and said, Nancy's gonna be home in four days and she wants you out of here. How did you react to that? It was like, oh my God, how are we gonna do this in four days? The couple's now jammed into a small motel room in nearby Basalt, Colorado, with their possessions and a festering grudge against Nancy Pfister. Did you ever say anything? Yeah. Like, I'd love to have this woman out of my hair. I'd, want, uh, I'd love oh, to God. kill this woman. I said, this is a woman that I dislike, that I hate this woman. I said, I could wring her neck. 
Did you ever say, I could kill this woman? I did. So you were that angry? Yeah, I said that. And I prefaced it by saying, I've never said this before. But I could kill this woman. And soon, someone did. On February 26, four days after Nancy had returned home, Kathy Carpenter discovers her battered body and calls 911. Later, there's one more thing she'd tell police. As she pulled up to the house, she'd seen someone leaving, driving right past her. Had she caught a glimpse of the killer leaving the scene of the crime? And was it someone she could identify? Stay with us. Once again, Deborah Roberts. The investigation into the murder of heiress Nancy Pfister in Ritzy, Aspen, Colorado, goes into overdrive. Dr. Trey Styler, wearing his wife's terry cloth bathrobe and not much else, barely awake as police arrest the couple at a low-budget motel. 5.30 in the morning, I hear this banging on the door, and I looked out the door and I, all I saw was cops. And, and what, what's going through your head? I looked at my husband, who was sleeping, and I said, Trey, am I dreaming? One of the guys says, you're not dreaming, there's a dead body. Kathy Carpenter, who found the body, was already pointing a finger at the Stylers even before she got off the phone with 911. My, my friend came back from Australia and said she disturbed her and she had some people living there and she really pissed them off and um, she made threats to them about owing money and I don't know. Everything is pointing to the Stylers at this point. Well, basically the focus is on the Stylers. The Stylers had just been evicted by Nancy Pfister, and she demanded more money from them just before she died. Now, authorities are working overtime in the interview room. Man, if somebody snaps, we just need a note. I don't know what happened to her, when it happened. As the interrogations drag on and on for hours and then days, the Stylers don't try to hide their anger at the dead woman. We were just Nancy. Um, she had Screw this up, good time. Do you feel bad about that she's dead? Oh, You've got two groups of people here who are very desperate for money, Nancy and the Stylers. Money is the, the thread running through all of this. You've got two different lives that have been losing their grip on their status. Yes, Nancy Fister is not an A-list party girl as much as she once was in Aspen. And the Stylers have virtually lost everything by 2013. So it's a volatile mixture. It's just building and building and building. Did that volatile situation lead to murder? Now under police scrutiny, the Stylers and Kathy Carpenter's friendship turned to self-preservation. I didn't do it. My husband didn't do it. And I start putting together in my small little courtroom mind that Kathy did this. So you convinced that Kathy had killed her friend Absolutely and boss? Absolutely convinced. Detectives, too, are convinced that Kathy Carpenter, the long-suffering personal assistant, was somehow involved. They bring her in for questioning. Do you know exactly what you saw? Having flashbacks of that. Investigators say she soon slips up offering a little too much information, details about the appearance of the body only a killer or an accomplice would know. And I just saw the head because it was right when I opened it. I would walk in and I, I saw her first, the head. So I don't remember the position, but I knew her, the blonde hair and the length of her hair, and then there was like... So then she so was okay. And then there was but how could she have seen blood or Nancy's hair if, as she told police, the body was bundled up when she found it? How much blood did you see? On the head. Okay. I just remember on the head. Police confront Kathy with crime scene photos showing the body completely covered. We have you saying, I saw hair. Impossible no hair. to see the hair. No Impossible hair. to see the hair. Do you want to look at Kathy? No, look at him. There's no there was one. None. It seems like an aha moment that can only mean one thing. That she had to have seen that body before it was placed in the closet and covered. Investigators zero in on other perceived inconsistencies in Kathy's statements. 
First, she told them as she arrived to check on Nancy, she'd seen the stylers leaving the driveway. But then she said she hadn't seen them. Which one is it? It shouldn't be that hard to remember whether you just saw two people at the crime scene where a body was found or you didn't. And more suspicious behavior. Kathy eventually admits taking valuables from Fister's safe deposit box after her death, jewelry and thousands in cash. Where did that 6000 go? I have it. Okay, where? And oh yes, there was a ring too. It belonged to her mother and the sisters were all fighting for it. Nancy got it and Nancy told me if anything should happen, make sure that this goes to children. So she had stolen from Nancy, presumably when she was dead. But what really got them was her description of what she saw in the closet. That was probably the turning point. Their conclusion was she saw the body after the murder and before it went into the bag. So maybe that she didn't necessarily kill her, but she was aware of it. Even as police push Kathy, they also lean on their other suspects, the doctor and his wife. They take note of Trey Styler's apparent physical decline. He walks into the first interview, but then begins using a wheelchair. I'm f disabled. He repeatedly tries to impress upon them he's too weak to hurt a fly. I'm a sick I couldn't beat up a kid. If police smell something fishy in Styler's story, it's about to stink even more after someone opens a nearby trash bin. We got incredibly lucky uh, with that break in the case. One man's trash becomes a police officer's treasure. When we come back, Continue with relationships from hell. Once again, Deborah Roberts. It is the spring of 2014. Even as the snow is melting from the mountains of Aspen, evidence in the Nancy Fister murder case is piling up like a Rocky Mountain snow squall. And there's no shortage of suspects. Just days after the killing, investigators are focusing on Fister's disgruntled renters, Dr. Trey and Nancy Styler, and her friend and assistant, Kathy Carpenter, now also a suspect. Outside the interrogation room, the investigation breaks wide open, mostly because of good luck. An important find just steps from the Styler's motel room, a key piece of evidence. Literally, that missing key possibly taken by the killer. The key was to the closet in which uh, Nancy Fister's body was found. An easy find, maybe too easy, police suspect. Was someone trying to frame the Stylers? The key really just seemed to appear uh, out of nowhere. Was it possible that Kathy Carpenter even planted that key? And a few yards from the Stylers' rented room, another precious find by a zealous garbage man rooting through a trash can. I really sheer luck in the end uh, was what it was. Um, someone doing their job in the city of Basalt and checking the city uh, trash cans to make sure that uh, someone um, wasn't dumping their personal trash. And what's in the bag? Prescription bottles from Nancy Fister, the pearls that she got from her mother. And that's not all. There's also some of Styler's belongings. Oh, and another little item. Heavy steel stained with flakes of blood, a hammer. In a bag, no more than half a block or so from where the stylers were staying. That hammer was sent off to the lab where they were able to determine that that was Nancy Fister's blood on the hammer. Detectives confront suspects Trey Styler and Kathy Carpenter with that new evidence. We found the murder weapon. It was a hammer. But it'll take more than that bloody hammer to nail down an airtight case. Police begin the mind games, trying to get one suspect to turn on the other. Absolutely need to come clean now. Here is like an opportunity. This is a life-changing opportunity. What I want to do is give you a real opportunity to help yourself, okay? Let me finish, okay? This is an opportunity for you to help yourself. This is an opportunity that only comes along once. Now's the time to be first to the plate before anyone else, because once 
to other people. You know what I'm talking about? Knowing that you're here, it's going to come down to, holy crap, we have to save ourselves. You know, you're responsible for this death. We are going to prosecute you for it. I'm just trying to make it an easy road instead of a bumpy road. We have the silers, and they're, they're saying some stuff. Do you think that they're saying, gee, yes, John, I did all this? Or do you think they might be saying something else? Nancy Styler isn't talking because she has an attorney who's keeping her quiet. They said they have no evidence. The only thing they're holding you for is that they're thinking that this couldn't have been done alone and that either you and Kathy or Kathy and Trey had done this or they thought all three of us conspired. Did you all three conspire? Heck no. But eventually, prosecutors charge all three suspects. And you were charged with first-degree murder. What did you make of them when you heard those charges? Surreal, like a nightmare. I've never even had a parking ticket. They're making a big mistake. I knew I had nothing to do with it, and I knew in my heart that my husband had nothing to do with it. But the game of poker fails. The Stylers and Kathy Carpenter refuse to fold, insisting they're innocent. So are you telling me that? Are you telling me that I you right now, eye to eye? I have never seen the woman since she came back from Australia. That's a lie. I'll tell you eye to eye. 100 percent eye to eye. I'm letting you know that is hands down a lie. Not even a suspicious polygraph test can shake Trey or Kathy's story. I'm telling you right now, you failed the polygraph. I told you I felt in here that you absolutely were not being honest on the polygraph. You did not do well. You were deceptive on the polygraph. You failed the polygraph. What, is, what means you know what happened? Um, you do. And see, here's the deal. We will find what's going on. We will find what we need. Is it possible that Kathy maybe knew more about this than she wanted to let on? No. No. Kathy is 100% innocent. Greg Greer is Kathy Carpenter's attorney. She didn't know anything. She wanted to help find the person who did this to her friend. Yes, police have recovered the wandering closet key, and they now have the murder weapon in hand, that bloody hammer. But the case is far from a slam dunk. Prosecutors admit it's largely circumstantial and much weaker than they'd like. In this day and age, juries expect to see that smoking gun, that DNA evidence, and this was a very clean crime scene. But then, a surprise message from a jailhouse cell changes everything. The doctor says he can identify the killer, if only he can get investigators to believe him. I don't buy everything that you're selling me today, okay? Oh, uh, that's your privilege. Don't go away. Once again, Deborah Roberts. You could say the murder of Aspen Golden Girl Nancy Pfister is the story of three rooms. The bedroom on West Buttermilk Road where her battered body was dumped in a closet like so much laundry. The interrogation room where police spend so many inconclusive hours with three suspects. And a courtroom where prosecutors now expect to make their case. But it never gets that far. From the jail where murder suspects Kathy Carpenter, Nancy Styler, and Dr. Trey Styler are locked up awaiting their day in court, an urgent message. The doctor has something to get off his chest, something that will shock everyone, including police and his wife. I need to feel very comfortable that you were telling me the truth today, all right? I intend to tell you the truth. Um, the complete truth. Uh, Yes. The former renowned anesthesiologist who had proclaimed innocence from the beginning, refusing to admit anything, now matter-of-factly telling a horrifying story. When the hammer came back um, and started hitting the hammer. 
And there it is, the murder of Nancy Pfister solved. Now to a break in a mysterious murder case in Aspen. New details in the murder of an Aspen socialite. The good doctor, the medical man who'd once taken an oath to do no harm, now confessing he'd done just that. At that point, I didn't step back and basically at the thought, what the hell have I done and what do I do now? Styler says he puts her body into trash bags, wraps it in bedding, and drags it into the closet. I had some vague thoughts that I would return at some other time to take the body and put it someplace else besides the house, but I never did. Investigator Lisa Miller and another officer take Styler's confession. She presses him. Was it premeditated? You're telling me you're standing over her sleeping body and you made this snap decision to bash her head in. Uh, that's the best way I know to describe this. At times, Miller seems to lose patience with the doctor. And look at me. Because we're talking about the end of someone's life here. So we can at least look each other in the eye when we're having this conversation. On the other hand, Styler is now willing, even eager, to talk about killing Nancy Pfister. Right. And there. Where? At the top of her head, uh, which, if you don't mind. I do mind you touching me, quite frankly. Okay. Okay. Your husband is confessing to killing Nancy Pfister. Correct. Did you believe that he was capable of it? Now I do, because I made him explain. And what did he say? And he said, I looked at her there peacefully while our life was being torn apart. And he said, I lost it. I totally lost it. And I said, Trey, you know, I, I can't even imagine this. And I said, you actually hit her with a hammer. He said yes. And what are you thinking and feeling at this moment? I, disbelief. And that I had slept next to this man for six nights after he did the murder and I didn't even notice it. Didn't notice she was sleeping with a killer. But Nancy Styler and Kathy Carpenter are also charged in the murder. So now officers taking the doctor's confession come to a critical question. What role did those two women play in the killing? Styler says none. Neither one of them were involved in any way. They, in fact, had nothing to do with it. Were completely unaware of it, to the best of my knowledge. He was steadfast in saying that Kathy Carpenter um, was not present for the murder, did not help in the murder, did not cover the murder up, and same for his wife. But wait a minute, isn't the doctor practically an invalid? From the day detectives meet him, he's sitting on the floor to ease a bad back, struggling to stand up. As you can see, I'd be a formidable adversary. Complaining that he was physically incapable of having committed a brutal crime. My condition is such that I don't think I could be a kid. How is it possible that this man, so frail he now relies on a wheelchair, could go up and down stairs, move a body, and flip a queen-size mattress all on his own. We're thinking, you know, how could he physically um, do that? Miller says pay close attention to this moment when they take a break during Styler's confession. We will stretch our legs. Do you need to stand and stretch yours? Are you fine, Yes, ma'am. We took a break and I asked Mr. Styler if he wanted to uh, stand up and he informed me he couldn't stand up. He didn't have the strength to. And you want me to believe you had no help in that room? You were physically capable of doing everything that you have told me that you have done to this point. I'm reminded of those stories of uh, uh, women lifting cars off of their children. Mr. Steiner, I, I will do a lot of things in the interview room, but I'm not going to compare a mother saving a child with you murdering Nancy Fister, so let's don't go there. Trey Styler's pretty diminished physically. Is it possible that he could have committed this brutal crime and dragged this woman into a closet when he can barely stand? A major question running through the whole case was Trey Steiner physically capable of doing this crime by himself. If he was, then everything else was an act. After so many months in jail and so many denials, why does the doctor decide to give himself up? 
police now wonder, was Styler lying before about the degree of his disability to protect himself, or is he lying now to protect his wife? Some people believe that he had to have help. Right. Some people believe that that help had to be you. Right. Did I mean, you help him? Not at all. Were you a part of this? Nothing like that. And if he had come to me and said, I've just done something horrible, I would have called the police right away and... But Nancy, you were just as angry with Nancy as he was. Yeah. You had even said, I'd like to kill that woman. Yeah. Why wouldn't you two do it together? It's just, it's not my nature. It's not my nature to do something like... I, I can't imagine killing a person. But what troubles people, Nancy, is that there are things in here that just don't add up. Mm -hmm. You know, your husband is physically diminished. Mm -hmm. He pleads guilty not only to killing this woman, but moving the dead weight of her body into mm -hmm. a closet. People will say that just doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is I sleep at night. The doctor has confessed, but the two other suspects, his wife Nancy and Kathy Carpenter, aren't out of the woods yet. Don't go anywhere. Continue with relationships from hell. Once again, Deborah Roberts. The Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen, Colorado has an unusual and unsettling feature. Unlike most other statues of justice, this one wears no blindfold. In Aspen, justice looks over the town. And the town is looking for justice, questioning Dr. Trey Styler's surprise confession that he alone brutally murdered Nancy Pfister. The case is resolved, and I don't think we really know what happened. We have a situation where the police and the legal authorities have accepted a confession from somebody, and there are lots of holes inside this confession. It's very accurate to say that it's going to be an open question in a lot of people's minds as to whether or not uh, he did take sole responsibility because he didn't have much to lose and because he wanted to protect his wife and Kathy. Some people think that you and Kathy somehow got away with murder and that your husband is paying the price. Yeah, it's so wrong. It's so wrong. If Styler's plan was to take the rap for his wife, it worked. After three months in jail, Nancy Styler and Kathy Carpenter are free women tonight. We're not going to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Nancy Styler or Kathy Carpenter were responsible for that murder. The jail part was a day at the beach compared to learning that the person that you've been with for 32 years committed such an awful crime. I mean, I would take time in jail over that any time. As for Kathy Carpenter, in Aspen, she still wears a stain of suspicion. Her whole image had been destroyed. Her, her concern was, how will I ever be who I was in this town? How will I ever walk in here again? She's still just very broken over it. Kathy faces an uncertain future. With new evidence, prosecutors say they could, in theory, refile charges at any time. Dr. Styler got 20 years for his crime, at his age quite likely a life sentence. As for Nancy, her case was dismissed with prejudice, meaning if new smoking gun evidence were to emerge tomorrow, Nancy Styler can never be tried in Fister's murder. Recently I caught up with Nancy Styler as she headed back behind bars, this time as a visitor to see her husband.